Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, everybody. It's always uh, great to visit Italy. Um, as uh, as Alberto said, I've been to Udine several times, but I've never been to Turin, so that's exciting. First time in Turin, in some sense. Um, right, and again, yeah, I'd like to uh, point out that this is a uh, joint work with Marta Fiore Coronis, who, as Alberto said, just, well, maybe not just, but maybe a year or so ago, finished her PhD in Udine, and Giovanni, who's finishing his PhD in Leeds this year. Okay. Uh, uh, right, so this is the um, theorem that I would like to look at. Okay, so I'm calling this an inside-outside uh, Ramsey theorem. Um, so I want to uh, I want to compare this statement with the classic uh, Ramsey theorem for pairs and two colors. But let's first um, take a look at what this what this theorem says. Okay, so this is a theorem of rival and sand. So I'm just going to call this the rival sands theorem, and it says that if I've got any countably infinite graph. Uh, G, then I can find an infinite set of vertices H such that every every vertex from the graph, right, be it in H or be it not in H, has exactly uh, zero, one, or infinitely many neighbors in the uh, in the H. Okay, so every so that I've got the special infinite set H such that every vertex in the graph has. Uh, fits into one of these three buckets. It's got zero neighbors in H, it has exactly one neighbor in H, or it has exactly infinitely many uh, neighbors in H. Okay, and uh, um, you can convince yourself that the zero, one, and infinitely many options are all uh, all necessary. If you, uh, um, for example, if you take out, if you want to take out one, then the theorem is not uh, true anymore. You need, uh, you need zero, one, and uh, infinitely many as all, all as options for this to be true. Okay, and again, I'm calling this the uh, rival sands theorem, and I'm going to uh, indicate it with RSG, and the G means for graphs, uh, just to distinguish it from another statement of a similar flavor about partial orders that um, that I'm not talking about today. Okay, I'm just going to focus on the graphs today. Okay, so so right, so I want to compare this RSG statement to Ramsey theorem for pairs and two colors, which uh, me and many other people denote as RT22. Okay, and the 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 motivation here, Rival and Sand's original motivation is to uh, um, provide a theorem that's of a similar, you know, Ramsey theoretic theorem, similar to Ramsey's theorem for pairs and two colors, but um, that sort of gives you some information about what's going on outside of this uh, special set H. Okay. So let's let's look at Ramsey's theorem for for pairs and two colors in its graph theoretic formulation, okay? Which then says if I've got some infinite uh, countably infinite graph G, uh, right? Ramsey's theorem for pairs says that there is some infinite set of vertices H such that the induced subgraph on H is either a clique or an independent set, okay? So I like to think about these sort of things in terms of uh, sort of as a as problems with instances and solutions. So in the RT22 world, or I guess in both worlds for RT22 and uh, RSG, right? It's got the same class of instances, right? It's just countable, countable graphs. Okay. In the RT22 world, right? The solution to such an instance is an infinite set of vertices that forms either a clique or independent set. Okay. So there in the RT22 world. Right, the solution tells you everything you need to know about what's going on inside of the special set H, right? Either every vertex is uh, adjacent to all the others or no adjacent is adjacent to any other vertex. Okay, so you have complete information about what's going on inside of this uh, H, right? But no information at all about what's happening between the vertices outside of H and, and H. Okay, but for the uh, RSG uh, problem, Right, you give up a little bit on um, knowing about what's going on inside of H, but you gain some information about the relationship between things that are uh, not in H and things that are in H. Okay, so a solution, a solution um, to an instance graph in the sense of RSG, 
right? You know that for every vertex in the graph, right? Be it an H or not, it's going to be adjacent to either zero, one, or infinitely many members of the uh, of the solution set H. Okay. Right, but again, on the other hand, you don't know quite as much as what's going on inside of uh, inside of H, right? You can you can't necessarily take this H to be a uh, to be a clique or an independent set. Okay, so you have to give up a little bit on the regularity inside H itself to gain the sort of information about what's happening between the outside of H and the inside of H. Okay, so we call this RSG a sort of a inside-outside Ramsey theorem for for that reason. Right? This uh, sort of trade-off. Okay. Right, so I'm uh, working in computability theory and reverse mathematics, and a lot of what we like to do is to um, characterize theorems such as Ramsey's theorem for pairs and now this rival Sands theorem in terms of what axioms do you need to prove these theorems and sort of what are what are the computability theoretic properties of the um, of the of the solutions? Okay, so this has been done uh, for Ramsey's theorem for pairs in, I guess I'd say, extreme detail, and we would like to do the uh, same thing for this RSG, right? To compare it to RT22, right? This RSG theorem is very similar flavor um, to RT22. And so it's natural to ask um, what what are the relationships between these two theorems, right? Computationally and axiomatically, right? Is one harder to prove than the other? Does one have more uh, complicated solutions uh, than the other? Okay. And what we're going to show is that um, in all of these senses, the RSG theorem is uh, stronger than than Ramsey's theorem for pairs. Okay. And uh, and in, in fact, what we can say is that we'll make this um, idea more precise uh, later, but um, we can give a really a precise relationship between sort of the strength of Ramsey's theorem for pairs and RSG, right, which is indicated by the following here, right? It turns out in the end that being able to solve one instance of um, RSG is, is equivalent to being able to solve countably many instances of uh, RT22 simultaneously in parallel. Okay, so that is where we are, uh, where we're going. Okay, so they're sort of looking at this for from two related, uh, from two related viewpoints. One is axiomatic strength and, um, and reverse mathematics. So that's what I have uh, here, just a little um, sort of refresher about reverse mathematics. So here we're working in second order arithmetic which means we have numbers, natural numbers, and sets of natural numbers, but also anything you can code as natural numbers or sets of natural numbers. Okay, so we can talk about like um, uh, countable graphs, for instance. Okay, and uh, here are some popular axiom systems. The first three of the so-called big five, right? Our usual base system is the system called RCA, RCA not. Um, which is colloquially saying that computable sets of numbers exist. Okay, so the idea is that uh, your sort of stronger and stronger axioms give you um, more and more complicated sets. So I'll just uh, talk about these systems of second order arithmetic in terms of um, um, set existence axioms and just ignore issues about induction for today. Okay, so moving on from RCA not, we have this uh, system called weak Kerning's lemma which is a sort of encapsulating the logical strength you need to make various sorts of compactness arguments. Okay, so this, this uh, adds to RCA not the axiom that says, if I've got some set that somehow codes a uh, countable zero one branching tree, then, then that tree has an infinite path. Okay, so it's uh, expressing this, this uh, what turns out to be a weak form of a uh, Kerning's lemma. And then moving on from that, we have uh, ACA not for arithmetical comprehension, which is saying that any uh, set of natural numbers which you can define by an arithmetical formula exists. Okay, and this uh, this RT22 theorem is now uh, well known to be strictly below um, arithmetical comprehension and incomparable with weak Kerning's lemma. Okay, so the story is that ACA not proves RT22 
and um, uh, but neither RT22 nor neither of RT22 and weak Killing Sama can prove the other over the base uh, base system RCA RCA not. Okay, and ba basically, basically every piece of that was a was a uh, major breakthrough at its time in uh, in this in this area. Okay. Right. So, right. So the axiomatic uh, strength of things is closely related to its uh, computability theoretic strength. So I just wanted to maybe have a slide here refreshing some computability theory notation. So we've got um, all of our Turing machines, all of our Oracle Turing machines listed out in some effective way. When I equip a, a Turing machine with some Oracle F, but uh, denote that with the F in the superscript. Okay, and then we have this uh, down arrow notation to mean that some computation halts and uh, up arrow up arrow notation meaning that it doesn't halt. All right, so then F Turing reduces to G. If um, if I have some Oracle machine that computes F when I give it Oracle G. Okay, and then we say that two functions F and G are Turing equivalent if they both uh, compute each other. All right, and then for every uh, Oracle Oracle F, we often look at um, the halting problem relative to that Oracle F, which is usually denoted F with the little prime here and red F jump. And that's the set of all uh, indices E such that machine E with input E halts when you use Oracle F for the computation. All right, and um, I, Use zero to denote the uh, constantly zero function, which often we like to think of as just the sort of characteristic function of the empty set. And then, uh, then this uh, zero jump is, uh, well, denotes this set here, which um, usually we just think as of as being the usual halting set. Okay, and then you can iterate these uh, Turing Turing jumps right by. So you have start with some function f, and you can take its jump, okay, and then then you can use f jump as an oracle as well, and figure out what the Turing jump of that is, right, which is this set I've indicated down here at the bottom, and uh, my and I would like to point out that um, the double jump uh, essentially tells you which um, which machines are total and which machines are not total, right? So one jump tells you. Um, basically, which machines halt on which inputs, and two jumps tells you which machines halt on all inputs. All right. Okay, so here are two of many facts uh, describing the complexity of Ramsey's theorem for pairs. Okay, so if I start with a computable or delta one instance of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, then it always has a pi 2 definable solution, but not necessarily a, a sigma 2 definable solution. Okay, so this is um, giving some definability bound on how complicated uh, solutions to instances of RT22 can be. Okay, and then here's another, another, another bound um, on how complicated solutions can be in terms of, uh, in terms of these Turing jumps. Okay. So this uh, second one is saying that every computable instance of Ramsey's theorem for pairs has some solution H that's not so bad in the sense that its double jump is as small as it could possibly be. Okay, its double jump is the same as a uh, zero of double jump, which has which is the smallest thing that a double jump could possibly be. Okay, and then this uh, you could use this idea. Um, the second statement here as the basis of, for a proof that shows that RT22 is strictly weaker than um, uh, than ACA not. Okay, so ACA not gives you the strength to um, <clears throat> climb sort of all the way up the arithmetical hierarchy, but uh, this says that you can make models of RT22 that sort of stay below just the two jumps level. Okay. So that's uh, part of the story with RT22. All right, we want to look at sort of similar things, but for now this uh, RSG statement. So here's the, I guess, one proof I would like to uh, I would like to talk about in some some detail, which is a very slickified, or at least I think very slickified proof of this RSG 
uh, theorem. Okay, so this is not the original proof. This is uh, this is our proof, and it's close to the optimal proof um, in terms of in terms of uh, computational strength. Okay, so that's what I want to. That's what. So that's what this talk is about, right? Uh, looking at um, looking at this proof, and then discussing what um, uh, how much computational strength you need to carry out this proof. All right. So remember what the theorem is, right? We have start with some countable graph G with vertices V and edges E. And what we want is this special set H such that every vertex in the whole graph is adjacent to either zero, one, or infinitely many members of that special set H. Okay, so just a little notation for every uh, vertex, I'm gonna denote its set of neighbors by N. And let's let the set F be the collection of all vertices that have only finitely many neighbors. Okay, so 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 what we're going to do depends um, on first of all whether or not the set F is finite. Okay, so if only finitely many vertices have finitely many neighbors, then it's very easy to come up with a uh, RSG solution H to our graph. Right? We take our finitely many vertices with finitely many neighbors. We take that finitely many neighbors. Okay, so that's the set I've got in the parentheses here. Um, that's finitely much stuff. We throw it all out. Everybody else has infinitely many neighbors. And well, then that's the solution, right? This, this set H has the property that every vertex has infinitely many vertices or infinitely many neighbors in, in H. Okay, so if F is finite, only finitely many vertices have finitely many neighbors, then things are easy. Collect up all the finite stuff and throw it out. Um, otherwise, we have to do something. Okay. So the interesting case here is when infinitely many vertices have only finitely many neighbors. And to do this, uh, what, I, what I want is a set uh, that's cohesive for the collection of, of neighbors. Okay, so this is a, a bit of terminology that I maybe should have defined earlier. So the idea is, if I have any any countable collection of subsets of omega, right? I can find some set that's some set C that's so-called cohesive for that collection, meaning that um, for every for every set, my C is either eventually contained in that set or eventually contained in the in the complement. Okay, and moreover, I can do that uh, inside of any infinite set. Okay, so that's what I want. I want this, so my F is infinite, so I want an infinite subset C of F that's cohesive for the sequence of neighbors, right? Meaning that for any V in my graph, right, either eventually everything in C is a neighbor of V or eventually um, nothing in C is a neighbor of, of V. Okay, so I've got a countable graph, so this is a countable sequence of sequence of sets, so I can get this cohesive set C. All right, so now I'm going to choose my solution H from inside of this cohesive set C. All right, so that's going to be on the next slide here. Okay, so just a reminder of uh, the the data. I've got my F, my infinite set F consisting of all the vertices with finitely many neighbors only. Then I've got this C that's cohesive uh, for the neighbor sequence. All right, and now I'm going to think of every vertex in my graph as being either uh, red or blue, depending on which way the cohesiveness goes for that vertices neighbors. So the red Vs are going to be the ones uh, such that eventually every neighbor is in C, or sorry, such that eventually everything in C is a neighbor. Okay, so if C is eventually contained in the neighbors of uh, V, we'll call V red, and blue is the uh, is a, is the other option. If eventually nothing in C is a neighbor of V. Okay, so we'll think of our vertices as being either red or blue, in this way, and now I'll build my solution H right such that everybody in the graph has either zero, one, or infinitely many neighbors in H. Okay, so I'll just choose 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 guys from from uh, from C in a specific way to build this H. So first of all, I'll just pick any old x zero in C to get started. All right, remember that C is a subset of F, right? Which is to say that everybody in C has only finitely many neighbors. 
Okay, so in the picture, let's look down here. Let maybe this is X zero. This is my first uh, first guy I chose, and he has finitely many neighbors. Let's say these three guys here, right? Then the neighbors are either red or blue. Okay, so for the red ones, right? Eventually, everybody in C is a neighbor of the red ones, and eventually, everybody in C is a non-neighbor of the uh, of the blue ones. Okay, so if I go far enough out in C, right, I can find some point X1 that's, well, adjacent to both of the red ones and, and not the blue one, right, and also not the original X0, right, the original X0 should also be blue. Okay, so I'll choose that X1, right, that'll be my next point in my solution H. All right, and well, now I just keep going, right, I look now to find my X2, Right, I look at my neighbors of x0 and my neighbors of x1. Okay, that's still only finitely much stuff. Right, some are red, some are blue. And uh, if, well, if I go out far enough into my C, I can find a point that's adjacent to all of the red ones and none of the blue ones. Right, because eventually everybody in C is adjacent to all of the red ones and none of the blue ones. Okay, so I keep, I continue building my H in this way. And that will be a solution in the end, right? So consider some any old vertex in the graph. I need to know that it has either zero, one, or uh, infinitely many neighbors in my H, right? That vertex might not ever appear in this picture at all, in which case it's adjacent to nobody in H. All right, that's good, right? If it does appear in the picture, it either appears as a red vertex, right? In which case it's uh, adjacent to almost everybody, in uh, in H, which is good, okay. Or it appears as a blue vertex, right? And if it appears as a blue vertex, it's adjacent to that one guy where it just first showed up, and then to nobody else. Okay, so that's uh, so that's how you can prove this prove this theorem. Okay, and I and now uh, want to show in various ways how this is the uh, this is in fact the optimal proof of um, of this theorem. Okay, right. So we want to talk about how. So, hard sorry, so can I ask uh, how do you grant that the x zero you choose don't have uh, how how many vertex they are connected to at zero? At ah, zero? Yes. Okay. Vertex yes, okay. so at zero, x zero, x one, x two gets zero connection. The the. Yes. The X zero, X one, and X two they should all be blue, and they are, none of them are adjacent to any of the other ones. Um, right, because X X X X zero, X one, X two they're all chosen from C, which is a subset of F. So X zero, X one, and X two have only finitely many neighbors each. So mm -hmm. when I'm choosing X one, for example, I can also make sure I go past all the neighbors of X zero. And when I choose X2, mm -hmm, I can mm -hmm. make sure I go past all the X0. Okay. It's an imperfect picture. Yeah, sorry. They should also be blue. Okay. Um, anything else at the meantime? Okay, I will continue then. Um, Okay, right. So we didn't know sort of axiomatically and compu computationally what was required um, for this proof. And moreover, we want to show that our eventual answers to that are uh, are tight. Okay, so the first thing is that um, well, in this this uh, proof I described, basically everything that shows up is arithmetical. Um, so you can give this proof basically as I've described it in ACA not. So the system ACA not proves this RSG statement. Okay, but we, we want a, a little finer um, analysis of this situation, like what exactly in terms of Turing jumps say um, was required to, to run this proof. Okay, so for what, uh, for what given, some, given some graph G, uh, what functions F are able to compute the solutions H? Okay, so well, sometimes it's easy, right? In the case where only finitely many vertices had finitely many neighbors, uh, right? We just 
the solution was obtained just by removing some finite set. Okay, so that's uh, so that's that's easy, right? The original graph can can compute that. Um, again, the interesting question is, what sort of power do I need um, if infinitely many vertices have only finitely many neighbors? Okay, so in that situation, the proof I described uses, well, it uses this set F, okay? And it uses this cohesive set C, right? The set that was cohesive for the sequence of uh, neighbors. Okay, but you need to know more just than the C to run that proof. You need to know sort of also this red and blue assignment, right? You need to know right away for each vertex which way the cohesiveness goes, right? You need to know if C was um, contained in the eventually contained in the set of neighbors or eventually contained in the uh, in the complement. Okay, so we can sort of make some estimates of what it takes to do all of this. Okay, so. First of all, F is a F is a reasonably complicated set, right? This requires two jumps, right? Because to know, so F is the set of people that have only finitely many uh, neighbors. So this is asking, you know, there exists a point such that for all later points, it's it's uh, you know not adjacent. Okay, so that's a two quantifier question, and you need G double jump to compute that. Um, so we can we can sort of simplify the situation between the little c and the big c uh, just by observing that the uh, if you know the little c then you can compute the big c, all right? So actually all we need to all we need to do this is the um, is the big f and the little c. Okay, and to compute the little c, what you need is a so-called uh, zero one value DNR function relative to um, the data that you have, which is to say the F and the F and the A. Um, I don't want to say too much about this. It, the idea is that, uh, well, to compute a little C like this, you can think of it as trying to find um, a path through a certain tree. Um, it takes, so the tree you need Right, takes one more jump than the F and the A that you're looking at. So it takes F join A uh, jump to actually describe the tree that you want to pass through. And then if you have a DNR function, a two value DNR function on top of that, that's enough to give you the path and therefore the, uh, the C. Okay, so, so F took two jumps, uh, we needed one more jump to describe this tree to get C. So that's uh, so that's three jumps altogether. So to get the uh, to get the the little C in the end, you need a function that's DNR two relative to three jumps of G. Okay, so I think I'll yeah, I'll skip this bit about. Well, maybe we'll just say what a DNR two function is. Okay, and then and then go skip over the part about the trees. Okay, so yeah, just for sake of completeness, we say that some function g is two value diagonally non-recursive relative to some function function f. If um, <clears throat> if whenever it's the case that some machine e halts on input e using Oracle f, uh, this function uh, g tells you some number that's different than that. And also, G's outputs are always either zero or one. Okay, so the so the idea is that this function G, you can see it's not recursive relative to F just by looking along the along the diagonal, right? For every machine, um, G E is not computed by machine E because it's different at uh, at input E. Okay, so these uh, these DNR DNR2 functions come up a lot, and in this case, they're they're useful for finding paths through certain trees. Okay. But I don't want to say more about that. So let's go on to um, okay. So we so we said that to run that proof as I had written it, it takes a, a DNR2 function relative to three jumps of the graph you're given. Um, but just by a 
small observation, we can remove one of the jumps. And the observation is, well, this proof went by, okay, so we've got this set F, right, of uh, vertices that have only finitely many neighbors, takes two jumps in general to compute that F, and we need this uh, cohesive, uh, well, we need the little C, right, that's describing a cohesive subset of the F, right? And the observation is, well, we don't really need all of F to, to do this, right? Any, any infinite, um, Every inf any infinite set of f subset of f would uh, would do equally well. Okay, yeah, the proof and the proof it didn't it didn't matter that we had collected up actually absolutely every one of the vertices that has only finitely many neighbors. It just mattered that we started from some f that contained infinitely many that consisted of infinitely many such vertices. Okay, so we could run exactly the same proof starting from any infinite subset of uh, f. Okay, and now we can observe that F has an infinite subset that's simpler than F itself. Okay, so the idea here is that, um, so there's a classic fact that if you have an infinite um, recursively enumerable set, then it has an infinite recursive subset, and we're basically using that fact but one level up. Okay, so again, this F is a sigma 2, right, or RE in G jump. And by this fact, it means it has an infinite subset that's recursive in G jump. Okay, so this is all to say that we could start from an F that um, takes one jump instead of two jumps. And that's how we removed a, a, a jump from, from this whole thing. Okay, so in the end, we don't need a function that's DNR2 relative to three jumps of G. What we need is a function that's DNR2 relative to two jumps of G. Okay. and uh, eventually, I want to uh, explain that this is uh, this is optimal. Okay, so 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 this is the in the end the uh, the answer. If you start with some graph G and you want to compute an H, um, that's a rival sand solution to G, you need two jumps of G and a function that's DNR two on top of that DNR two relative to to two jumps of G. Okay, which is a uh, which is stronger than what was needed for the um, uh, RT two two. Uh, okay, so I want to uh, so the um, so the so the so our proof of RF of uh, RSG is non-uniform, right? It was well, if there if the set F were finite, we'd do one thing, and if it's infinite, uh, we'll do something else. But actually, you can uniformize that into uh, into one single procedure. But I don't want to um, uh, go to, into any details about that. I uh, just want to mention that you can do it. Um, okay. So right. So we proved that uh, if you start off with some graph G, it takes a DNR two function relative to two jumps of G in order to um, uh, uh, in order to come up with a solution, right? So now, what 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 uh, what we want to do is show that that's somehow equivalent, right? There's an equivalence between solving um, RSG instances and producing these sort of functions, right? Things that are DNR two relative to the double jump of something. Okay, so I want to formalize all of this uh, in the world of uh, what's called Weierrock reducibility. Okay. So the uh, so the idea here is that I've got I'm thinking of RT22 and RSG and things like it in terms of problems right that have inputs and outputs or instances and solutions. Okay. Uh, so for example, for I've, I've been saying RSG instances and also RT22 instances are countable infinite graphs, right? And then an RSG solution to such an instance is the H. That you get out of the theorem. Okay, so we've got problems with instances and solutions. All right, and then I want to talk about a, a problem, one problem P being reducible to another problem Q in a uniform computational way. Okay, so this is the idea of Weierach reducibility, and it's capturing the idea of if I could somehow solve 
this problem Q, right? Then together with uh, that ability to solve problem uh, Q and a couple of machines, I could build a widget to solve my problem P, right? If we do that, then we say that P Y rock reduces to Q. Okay, and the idea is, um, so I want to uh, think of Q as a black box, or in this case, as a blue circle, which takes in Q inputs and spits out uh, Q outputs. Okay, and I, now I want to uh, build a widget that would solve the uh, the P problem. Okay, so what I what I want to do is, well, I'll have this encoding machine phi. Okay, so, so uh, an instance to the P problem comes into phi. Right, phi does a computation and converts that into a Q instance. Right, the Q blue circle spits out some solution to that Q instance. Right, now I've got the decoding machine phi that takes as input the original P instance, okay, and this Q solution, and together decodes that information into a solution to the original P problem. Okay, so if it's so if it's a possible to build such a widget for P using Q, then we say that P uh, Y rock reduces to reduces to to Q, right? So uniform uniform um, computational way of using Q to solve P. All right, so I want to show there's a Y rock equivalence. Or at least I want to tell you, I guess, there's a Y rock equivalence between this RSG problem and this idea of producing DNR2 functions relative to the uh, double jump. Okay, so we have to think of this DNR2 thing as a as a problem, right, in the sense of instances and solutions like we did with RSG. Okay, so this will be the problem of its inputs are just any old function P. Right, take any function P as an input, and then the outputs, right, the solutions to the DNR2 double jump problem are functions H that, well, are DNR2 relative to P double jump. Okay, so just think of this as a problem in the most uh, straightforward way. And what, we, what um, <clears throat> I argued for the sort of analysis of our proof of RSG is that um, is that uh, RSG Y rock reduces to the DNR2 double jump problem. Okay, so if you've got this DNR2 double jump problem, you can use it as a uh, you can build the widget right to compute RS RSG. Okay, but you have to do this uniform unif uniform uniformizing uh, step that I skipped over. Okay. All right, so now we want to go the other way around. Actually, this slide I want to skip, so maybe let's go back to this, uh, this slide here. All right, we want to go the other way around. We want to show that there's a, an equivalence, right? We want to show that we can somehow use um, RSG to produce DNR2 functions relative to the double jump of something. Okay. and. These slides that I want to uh, skip over are a maybe first step towards that, right? You can, it's not so difficult to code in one jump. Okay, so I have to, let me just skip over that. Um, <clears throat> so as a first step, right, you'd want to show that uh, um, you can at least use RSG to get one Turing jump, right? And as long as, long as all you're interested in is axiomatic strength and reverse mathematics, well, that's all you need. This uh, ACA naught system is equivalent over RCA naught to the statement um, uh, for every for every function f, there's some set that's the range of f, or equivalently for every uh, set function f or set x, the Turing jump of that f or x also exists as a set. Okay, so coding in one Turing jump is enough to uh, to obtain that, and therefore give you the uh, reversal in the sense of uh, reverse mathematics. Okay, so if all you like is reverse mathematics, then then that alone would give you a proof that RSG and ACA not are equivalent over over RCA RCA not. Okay, and this already 
and this tells you that the RSG is axiomatically stronger than, than RT22. Okay, RT22 is uh, strictly weaker than, than ACA0 by a, uh, by a famous theorem, uh, but RSG is equivalent to ACA0, so RSG is stronger. Okay, so so again, right? If all you like is reverse mathematics, then just coding in one Turing jump was enough to uh, to settle the strength of this thing, RSG. Okay, but um, well, that that analysis is a little unsatisfying uh, because uh, well, because there's this gap, right? The the reversal only coded in one Turing jump, right? But the proof we were analyzing uses uh, more computational power, right? That uses um, a function that's DNR2 relative to the double jump of the input uh, input graph. Okay, so so there's this so there's this gap of uh, between uh, the computational power used to prove the theorem and the um, sort of coding that was sufficient to obtain uh, ACA naught in the in the reversal. Right, and ACA naught is just too strong to see the difference between between these two things. Okay, so so we want to sort of zoom in on this at the level of the level of the Wyrock degrees to um, um, to close this gap between one jump and DNR two relative to the double jump. Okay, so we want to show that um, you you can code more than just single Turing jumps into RSG solutions. You can code um, the, your coding power exactly matches the strength of what was required to prove the theorem. Right? You can get these uh, DNR2 relative to the double jump uh, functions. Okay, so so that's so that's the game. It's fairly straightforward to settle the uh, axiomatic strength of this RSG. Um, but it leaves a sort of a obvious gap to look at, and we want to fill that gap. Okay, so so what we want to do is show that uh, the DNR two uh, double jump problem can Wyrock reduce to the RSG problem, and to do this, uh, what we did was factored through. Uh, third problem, which I'm going to call infinity or one in delta two. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the all the details of this, but I at least want to explain what this intermediate problem is. Okay, so to say what this is, first um, I'll remind you of what the delta two approximation to some set is. So we'll say that the delta two approximation to some set Z, right? This is just a function whose limit is the characteristic function of, uh, of Z. Okay, so I've got this two place function F uh, giving me outputs uh, zero and one, and it has the property that uh, for any N, right? If I fix the coordinate and look at the uh, limit as uh, S goes to infinity, right? If N is in my set Z, eventually this settles down to one. And if N is not in my set Z, eventually this settles down to uh, zero. Okay, let, let me point out that I'm intending this to be like a bold face uh, delta two. I'm not sure that's in the, in the slide. It doesn't really look that bold. Um, but this is the idea is that this, this set Z is delta two relative to whatever this F doing the approximating is. Okay, okay. so my, uh, my, my, Infinity or one problem is essentially the following. So I'm given some some sequence of sets A, right? Some sequence of uh, subsets of natural numbers A, with the extra property that every number is in only finitely many of these A's. Okay, and what I want as an output is an infinite set D such that for each of these A's, right? Either the um, intersection with AI is infinite, or the intersection with AI has, uh, has at most one element. Okay, so that's the, that's the infinity or one, right? For each of these A's, either D intersects it infinitely, or in a set of size at most one. 
All right, so that would be sort of the vanilla plane just in for one problem. But to get the uh, strength that we need, we need to uh, embellish this a little bit, right? We want to sort of direct where our set uh, D, our solution set D is supposed to come from, okay? So, so my, my instance is gonna be more than just the sequence of set A's. I want to uh, intersect either infinitely or in size at most one. Okay, I'm also going to input a delta two approximation to some infinite set Z and require that my uh, that my solution set D comes from this set Z. Okay, so that would be the n for one in delta two, and then the little star here is indicating that uh, for technical reasons to make the uh, proofs in the end work, I need to allow at least at most uh, one mistake in the D. Right, so the D is allowed to contain at most uh, uh, one thing that's not actually in Z. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Um, for this for this to be possible, right, it's essential to assume that uh, every every number is in at most finitely many of the uh, of the A's. Uh, right, otherwise you could make the A's just be the sequence of all finite sets, which uh, which wouldn't work. Okay, so I just want to point out that this extra assumption is is necessary. Okay, and I also want to point out that uh, this this infinity or one dichotomy is uh, of course meant to reflect this uh, how this RSG principle is, right? So in in my solutions here, right, I get a D that either infinitely intersects each AI or or intersects it in at most one point. Okay, that's supposed to reflect the idea of that in RSG solutions, right? Every vertex is adjacent to either infinitely many things in my solution set H or at most one thing in my solution set H. Okay, and this this is also maybe a little reminiscent of wanting to find a cohesive sets. Okay, so this this D, I mean, it's not necessarily cohesive for this sequence of A's, but the I think the idea is uh, is similar. Okay, so this so this n for one in delta two uh, problem is meant to sort of interpolate between the uh, the RSG and this idea of needing to find certain sorts of uh, cohesive sets to get the DNR to double jump strength. Okay, and that's and that's and yeah, and that's exactly what we did, right? We proved that um, uh, the DNR two double jump problem y rock reduces to this m for one in star delta two problem, which y rock reduces to the RSG problem. Okay, so then we've got that uh, all of these all of these three things are y rock equivalent, right? Because earlier we um, said that RSG reduces to the DNR two double jump problem. Okay. So let's see, starting to run out of time a little bit. I, um, okay, well, I didn't want to do so. We started a bit later, so you can still go on for a few minutes and no problem. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, so this I wanted to skip anyhow, right, to, uh, to reduce the n for one, infinity or one problem to RSG, right? Well, you have to. Build some graph to uh, <laughs> to code an in for one in delta two problem into some graph, right? And uh, uh, well, it's not really that much of a mess, but also I didn't draw a picture about it, so <laughs> maybe it's better just to skip over this. Um, let let me say just a little bit, perhaps, about how you get these DNR two uh, relative to the double jump functions out of this in for one in delta two problem okay just so there's like some hint of where this strength this particular sort of strength can come from okay so uh the idea here is that suppose i've got just any old any old function um p and i'm going to think of some finite string of zeros and ones i'm going to call that an approximation Right, the uh, so this uh, the bars here mean the length of sigma. So some string is going to be the length of sigma approximation to the jump of p if 
basically the sigma looks like the characteristic string of p jump, right? So long as you only run computations for the length of sigma many steps, right? Which is to say that, uh, well, if uh, I use machine phi with Oracle uh, phi e or with Oracle p on input e, and I only run that computation for the length of sigma many steps, but I see that that converges, then great, I should believe that uh, e is in p jump, and therefore that sigma e should be one. Okay, and if the length of sigma wasn't long enough to see that, then I shouldn't believe that e is in uh, p jump, so sigma e should be uh, should be zero. Okay, so sigma thinks it's uh, the initial segment of the Turing jump of p, right, up to how long sigma is willing to run these computations, which is the length of the string. Okay, so this is a completely computable thing relative to uh, to p, uh, right? So if I've got some p, right, the set of approximations, right, the set of sigmas satisfying this property are computable relative to p. Okay, but I want to think about that one level up, which is to say that the set of uh, string sigma approximating p double jump is then computable from p jump. Okay. And therefore that set can be approximated by P in the sense of uh, these Delta two approximations. Okay, so altogether, um, what I want to say is that if I've got any old P, then it could compute some function F whose, uh, that's a Delta two approximation, right? So whose limit is the characteristic function of this set here of approximations to P double jump. Okay, so there's sort of two layers of approximating uh, going on here. Okay, and I'm going to use this idea to to uh, build an inf for one in star delta two instance to to compute for me a DNR two double jump function in the end. Okay, so so given some I'm given some p. Right. I want a function that's DNR2 relative to P double jump. And so I have to build an M for one instance to tell me that. Okay, uh, so the instance I so what I so what I'm going to do is uh okay, so if my M for one instance, right, that consists of these sets A that I want to intersect either uh infinitely or at most one point each. Okay, and I have to also supply it an approximation to a uh, delta two set that I would like uh, my solution D to be a subset of. Okay, so my delta two, so the delta two set that I'm going to feed it in terms, you know, by giving it an approximation is the set of approximations to uh, P double jump. Okay, that's just what I said on the, uh, on the previous slide. Right, given p, I can compute some function f that is approximating the approximations to p double jump. Okay, so that's exactly the set uh, z I'm going to make part of my um, <clears throat> m for one instance. Okay, and then the a's I want to look at are uh, this sequence of a's. Okay, so the uh, so the even a's, right? A to e is going to be all of the sigmas of length at least e, right, such that uh, machine, such that if I use sigma as an oracle, it's long enough to see that machine e halts on input e. Okay, and um, similarly for two uh, e plus one, right, that's gonna be all of the other strings that are at least as uh, long as e. Okay, and then the uh, the length of sigma greater than e in both of these is just to make sure we satisfy that uh, any point can be in at most finitely many uh, a's criterion. Okay, so this is my this is my uh, instance, my in for one instance, and it gives me back a solution, right? Some set d, right? That's contained in this set z, except for at most one mistake. And I want to somehow use that to get the DNR2 function relative to P uh, 
to P double jump. Okay, so the so the the things in D are these strings that are all longer and longer approximations to P double jump, right? Except for at most one mistake. Um, okay, so if we look at if we look at longer and longer strings in in uh, D, right? Eventually, the their initial segments will be longer and longer sort of correct approximations to um, to uh, to P double jump. Okay. So, so I'm trying to so I'm trying to find a a function that's GNR two relative to this p um, double jump, right? Which means that I want to I'm given some e, okay? And if machine e on input e with Oracle p double jump tells me zero, I need to come back with one, right? And and uh, vice versa, right? I need to avoid sort of the values of uh, of machine E uh, with Oracle P double jump on input E. Okay, so to so to figure this out, right? I'll I'll look at how my set D intersects uh, these two sets A two E and A two E plus one. Okay, the two sets are essentially complements, right? If I look beyond uh, E. Okay, which which means that uh, the D has to intersect uh, one of them in size at least two, okay? And because it's an M for one in uh, delta two solution, if it intersects it in size two, right, we know the intersection has to be uh, infinite. Okay, right, so let's suppose that, uh, so, okay, so if I, so I just, watch both of these, right? And then eventually I'll learn that either this happens or this happens, okay? And if this happens, then the intersection is actually infinite, right? And similarly for the other one, okay? So suppose, suppose I do learn this eventually, right? That the intersection with D and A2E is greater than or equal to two and therefore infinite, okay? If it were actually the case, that machine E with uh, input E and using Oracle P double jump halted and gave me uh, output zero. Then eventually, all of the almost all of the strings in D would be uh, correct approximations to that, right? Because that only needs finitely much of uh, of P double jump, and my strings in D are becoming are correct longer and longer. As they as they get longer and longer, okay. So so if that so if that actually happened, right? And I learned that my uh, d intersect a two e was uh, was is infinite, okay. That that then I would know that um, well that computation must have converged to uh, to zero, and I should avoid that by outputting one, okay. And the uh, similar thing happens on the on the other side, right? Okay, so this is how this is how you can um, compute these functions. Okay, so let me just now uh, wrap up, right? So we showed that this RSG problem is Wyrock equivalent to the DNR2 double jump problem, right? Which exactly pins down how much uh, um, computability strength you need to prove this RSG theorem. Um, so separately, uh, Pratka and Rakato Hiniana proved that um, DNR2 double jump, right, the same problem is equivalent to the problem of you're given not just one graph, but countably many graphs, a countable sequence of graphs, and you want to simultaneously find an RT22 solution to all of them, okay, the so called parallelization of RT22. Okay, so that means we also have an equivalence between RSG and the parallelized RT22. Okay, so this is, makes precise this idea of the strength required to solve one instance of RSG exactly corresponds to the strength required to solve infinitely many or countably many instances of RT22 simultaneously in, in parallel. Okay, so so I think I think that's very nice, right? This RSG is something of very like RT22 
flavored, right? It's strictly stronger than RT22, right? In both the senses of Weirach degrees and reverse math, but we have this very precise description of what the strength of RSG is in terms of RT22, right? It's exactly solving infinitely many simultaneously. Okay, uh, that's all. Thanks so much for uh, humoring me, everybody. Thanks for. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I'm sad I don't get a nice like Italian seminar dinner tonight. That would be good. <laughs> no, no way for this online. Yes, we, we have yeah. not managed to arrange this yet. I mean, My plan was to there... order Thai food, but yeah, I've never given <laughs> a seminar in Thailand. Maybe I should switch. <laughs> all right, are you? Are there any questions or comments about post talk? So if I may, I, I, I think if you can go back to the previous slide, I guess. So this is, I, I think this is indeed very nice, but uh, you sort of see it by going through this double jump of WKL or DNR2, right? I mean, there is no apparent way of, of seeing this directly, I mean, that you can use the countably many instances of RAMC theorem for uh, actually solving R RSG. I, I, I don't have a direct proof in either direction of, of that. Um, I, I, I thought about it a little, and I guess uh, Giovanni and Marta also thought about it a little. Um, uh, yeah, but we never, yeah, we never yeah, invented exists. either a, a direct reduction between RSG and parallel RT22 in, in either way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the only way we know is to go by the, 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 what, the, the proof by Brad Kenra Kotarniana and by this other proof of yours, and then we notice that you get at the same place with uh, when you analyze these two different problems. Right, yes. I, um... But this also shows that actually Ramsey um, rival sense for graphs is what we call parallelizable, right? I mean, if you had countably many instances of that, that would be equivalent to just having just one. Right. This, yeah. is, this is not obvious at all, also. I mean, if you just look at the problem in its original formulation, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yes, it's not. Um... So it's a sort of byproduct of this result. Right. Well, DNR2 double jump and WKL double jump, I think, are clearly parallelizable. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah. there is no way of, yeah. So, well, yeah, right. So, you need that. Your so, theorem. So, it, so, it follows from, from this, yeah. And also from this, but you don't need the extra extra bits to conclude it. Mm. Yeah. As far, as far as I know, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we didn't, we didn't uh, invent a direct proof of parallelization either. Uh, I don't think we even thought about that. 